But I found that, you know, hand-to-hand combat, it was interesting to me. You could really improve yourself by any kind of combat. It kind of tells you who you are as a person. How's it going, everyone? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 708, with my guest today, Gene Myers. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring the best martial arts podcast we possibly can. We're constantly improving, constantly looking for ways to make everything that we're doing better. And if you want to see all the things that we do, well, head on over to whistlekick.com and you're going to see all the things that we've got going on. If my voice is new to you, I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I founded Whistlekick because I'm a passionate traditional martial artist. And that's why we do all the things that we're doing. And if you find some stuff that might be missing in your life, you may want to pick something up at whistlekick.com. We've got everything from training programs to apparel, training equipment. So check that over there. Check that out over there. And if you use the code podcast15, it's going to save you 15%. Now the show, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, gets its own spot, its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you head over there, you're going to find things like transcripts and videos and all kinds of good show note stuff related to this and every other episode we've done. They're all available. If you were to sit down and listen to them all in a row, you would die because there are... (laughs) There are hundreds and hundreds of hours of interviews and topic-driven conversations that we've had over the last seven years. What's the goal? Why do we do it? Well, to connect, educate, and entertain you, the traditional martial artists of the world. If that goal, if the things that we're doing mean something to you, you have a number of ways that you can support us and show your appreciation. You can make a purchase. You could also tell a friend about us or perhaps join the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. It's the place to go if you think maybe two bucks a month is a good entry point, you're going to get to know what upcoming episodes we have. You're going to get a back channel to the team, and it goes up from there. It's a wonderful value, as evidenced by the fact that people don't stop contributing to the Patreon very often. And if you want the entire list, all the ways that you can help us out in our mission, as well as a kind of a constantly shifting batch of behind-the-scenes content and other fun stuff, go to whistlekick.com slash family. That's whistlekick.com slash family. It's not linked anywhere. you got to type it in. But uh, it's worth it. We change it weekly. Gene Myers, today's guest, was one of the originals, one of the first people involved in the martial arts podcasting world. And I had a wonderful time talking to him, talking to him, of course, about those beginning times, but more so about him and his time training and what he does and why he does. And really, as you would all come to expect, his story. So here we are, my conversation with Gene Myers. Enjoy. Hey, how are you, Gene? I'm a little intimidated. Why? <laughs> well, you know, I, you've had some pretty accomplished martial artists on in, in the 600 some odd episodes you've had. And, <laughs> I know. How do you think I feel? Well, <laughs> someone has to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm small potatoes compared to those folks. So am but, I. Uh, no, you're not. No. Yes, I, I am. I, go? I'm just... Go? I, I'm a, the only reason the show is mine is because the guy that I asked to do it went and had a stroke and almost died. Oh my God. Yeah. Like, like really true story. Yikes. And I went, well, we kind of have to do this and I don't have anybody else. So I guess I'll freaking do it. You've been doing this a long time. Seven years. Wow. wow. And now seven twice years later, week. what's that? Twice a week too, right? We started twice a week with episode 39. So mm-hmm. about quite a year before we went to two. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Wow. But you you were doing it so much. I mean, you started a decade before I did. Well, yeah, but I mean, no, about 2000, 2003, I think. Okay. So 12 years before I did. Yeah. You had, you had Paul and Dana. Yeah. uh, Not too awful long ago. And they kind of, a little bit of the background, but uh, yeah. So. Yeah, in 2003, uh, I was training uh, uh, with uh, a gentleman, Pete Shambo. And um, the two of us would talk a lot about martial arts and, and various related subjects. And it, on Friday nights, Friday evenings, we would have a black belt class. Yeah. And uh, very often we'd go out afterwards, a bunch of us, you know, that attended class, and we'd bring our 
significant others and, and we go to a local tavern and, you know, quaff an ale or two and, and uh, down some chicken wings and, you know, talk about the martial arts. So Pete had this great idea. Uh, it, at the time, podcasting was in its infancy. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and Pete being the, the technical wizard that he is, um, thought, geez, it'd be nice to record this because we can't be the only martial artists around that, that do this kind of thing. And maybe there, if we, if we recorded it and had a forum, people would, would join in. We could converse with other people, you know, all over the world, maybe. And so that's how we started. Some of those set early sessions, we were a little bit uh, overserved, let's say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, still, they were fun. And Pete sold the show to Paul Wilson. Mm-hmm. Couldn't have found a better person to take over. Yeah, he's done, and, he's done some good stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I had the honor of staying on with him for a little while. Um, uh, Dan Williams joined us later on and, and only added to the quality of the show. Dan's more, uh, I guess, of an eclectic martial artist, whereas Paul is in uh, Shorin Ru karate, a different lineage than, I, than mine. And uh, and the three of us had at it for a little bit, but you know, life being what it is, uh, I I dropped out and turned the show over to them, and they've been doing great ever since. So uh, I- interesting, st- we were, according to Peter's research, we were the uh, first martial arts podcast. Period. Yeah, and and uh, there there was some controversy about that. I, um, there was, I, um, I'm trying to remember because I, I, I acknowledge the controversy. I'm trying to remember if we talked about that on the show, like on air, or if we talked about that off air. You, well, if you might have spoken about it on air, okay. Um, but in case you didn't, just, just to refresh your memory, sure. Um, there was a couple of guys down in Texas that came on, um, maybe about a couple, two or three months after us that were claiming that they were the very first podcast, martial arts podcast. And, uh, and we kind of challenged them on that. So they, they had kind of a, uh, kind of a resentment a little bit. I mean, it wasn't a competition. They did their thing. We did ours. Um, but, uh, you know, as I recall, they were, um, they were a couple of, uh, they, they may have been excellent, uh, karate practitioners. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, a couple of arrogant guys, I thought, and uh, and I told him so in an email, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that went really well. Oh, people, people I, I love told being it. told when they're arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, like I say, they they may have been proficient, you know, beyond all expectations, but um, but but I didn't care for their attitude, and and, uh, and as a listener, I felt I had to they had the right to give them some feedback. They were asking for feedback all the time. And, uh, so the very next uh, show they had, they, uh, they, they really tore me a new one, oh. which was, which was fun to listen to. So, so, uh, <laughs> arrogant being your opinion, but it sounds like that response indicates a great deal of sensitivity. Uh, yeah. I mean, they weren't, they weren't humble by any means mm-hmm. and they, they, they made great fun of uh of my rank i was a fourth don at the time so <laughs> i'm so sick of that crap I, I, I can't even tell you how sick of that crap i am really Be- you, you, because yeah because your your opinion is less meaningful on a non technique non training element because you so if you were a tenth don and you called them arrogant they would have listened whatever I, I don't i don't know about that they they don't seem to take feedback very well so uh, but anyway that's it, it was it was fun um i i enjoy listening to uh to martial arts podcast uh you know the karate cafe and you guys when i can and um it's some uh, good stuff we're, oh, we're in good company well my, that's why i say i was a little intimidated coming on because you've had some very accomplished people on that that have written books and starred in film and and television and and uh, won all these huge tournaments and yeah. and uh, I'm just a little <laughs> I'm small potatoes I'm just a you know a fifth don that practices really 
um, by myself now. Um, I, we, my wife and I moved, um, uh, we were from originally the Syracuse area, the central New York area. And I trained at, uh, Finger Lakes Karate in Auburn, mm -hmm. uh, for years. And, uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, we, my wife and I retired and we moved to Albany, which is probably a little closer to you guys. <laughs> you're, uh, you're, you're three hours for me. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, anyway, th there was no, there was no, uh, schools, no showroom schools around, around me. Uh, so I either have to go back to, to, you know, uh, Auburn or there's, uh, there's a, uh, Shoren Ru, uh, school in, um, Rhode Island, uh, or Connecticut. I've been there once. Uh, it's, uh, Mark Spears dojo. It's, is that uh, the closest school of your, of your lineage? Is all the way from Albany to, to down there? Yeah. Wow. Pretty now, much. Now, now here, here's a, here's a question. And this question comes up a lot. And so it's, um, please understand if, if you listen to the show, you, you understand that when I ask questions, there is not agenda to my questions other than I'm genuinely asking the question. Sure. It may sound loaded. It's not loaded. Why not train in something else? Why does it have to be, or why is it important to you that it is the same lineage of short run? Well, um, I'm 67 years old and I've been, I've been training in, in this art for about 30 years. Okay. And it would be very difficult for me to switch to another style of karate um, only because I'm just, I, I'm set in my ways. Mm. Uh, I have trained in other styles. Uh, I, I hold a Dan rank in the uh, Hakatsuru Kempo, White Crane Kempo. Mm. And uh, we trained in uh, two circle jujitsu, which was a derivative of Wally J's small circle jujitsu. Um, and, uh, so I'm not opposed to trying something else. I did train in judo some time ago, but you know, you, you get to be, get to be my age and, and I, I've considered it, believe me, I've considered it. And I've sat in on, uh, a, a, a Shotokan class a, a locally, mm -hmm. um, very good martial artist, excellent, uh, Shotokan practitioners. Um, it, but the class that I saw, and this was just, you know, one class, sure. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm not doing them full justice here, but, um, I, I like to study bunkai. Mm. Um, and, and to me, you know, ka studying kata is, is, is just the, the physical performance of the form, uh, is only the beginning. You know, you have to delve into into the bunkai sure, to, sure. to fully say you understand the kai. And I didn't really see any of that in the Shotokan class. Now, like I say, um, I, I only saw one class, and I'm not I I may not be being fair to them, but there was a lot of uh, emphasis on on the physical performance of the forms. Yeah. Um, so, you know. I have considered it. I haven't found one that, that I'd like other than the Shotokan that I thought I might try. Um, but it, I, what I would rather do was, was to commute, you know, to either mm -hmm. to New England uh, or back to, uh, back to central New York and, and train there. Um, There's something to be said for spending a bunch of time and finding what you like and furthering that, you know, and, and that's, again, that's why it wasn't a loaded question. It was a genuine question because when pe people moving and leaving a school that they enjoy is not an uncommon experience. Mm -hmm. And I think hearing different perspectives on how people handle it, I think is really valuable to the listeners. The, the only answer, as far as I'm concerned, that is a wrong answer is to not train anymore. Right, oh, kind of mirrors. You know, what's the only wrong move in a, in a self defense situation? Not moving, right? Mm -hmm. Anything is better than nothing, and I think the same thing applies in terms of training. And if your training scratches that itch for you, and you're you're digging what you're doing, I see I see zero issue with that. Yeah, um, 
I'm, we finished the house we bought. I, we finished the basement. That's mm-hmm. where I am now. And, uh, I'll come down here and, and there's room enough to move. Cool. Uh, so, uh, I, I come down and practice kata and, and, uh, you know, work out, uh, down here. Uh, but that that's one part of training to me. Other parts of training is, is research. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it includes books and videos, uh, like that. And, uh, and I'm always in search of, uh, good resources to, to further my knowledge of, of, uh, of the martial arts and self-defense. And, uh, I'm, I'm forever looking for different interpretations of the kata that, that we study. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting pursuit. It keeps you very busy. Mm. Uh, the only downfall for that, for me anyways, I have no partner to train. With. I use my wife once in a while. But <laughs> how, how thrilled is she about that? Uh, she, she, that very, she objects to the, does she train? Did she What's ever that? train? Does she train? No. Did she train? No, 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 she, she never did. Um, my daughter did my, my oldest daughter, Aaron, uh, and I, in fact, we started together oh, cool. and, and, uh, she got to be, um, she got to be pretty good. She got up to, uh, her green belt, which is a couple below black. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but then she was more interested in gymnastics and, and went that way. Um, so it sounds and, like adolescent, early teen. Yeah. Yeah, basically. And, and, uh, which is fine she did her own thing and, and I just stuck with it. And karate for me, in, in addition to just, um, the self-defense aspect, and I mean, there's the dough part, which is the, the self-improvement. And then there's the jitsu part, you know, where, where you're actually learning, you know, or, or incorporating the, the self-defense techniques and into your, into your persona, so to speak. Um, but uh, it's it's also a social aspect, isn't it? I mean, um, absolutely. I, I I was a psychologist for you know over thirty years, and literally I was on call twenty four seven, and uh, I didn't have much of a social life. I mean, we had friends and everything, but we didn't really get together that much. So uh, my social needs were filled by going to class most mm-hmm. of the time. Um, and, and, you know, moving here, you know, I don't have that. So, and then, then we had a pandemic, <laughs> so, you know, nobody was training anywhere right? Um, unless they were doing it virtually. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I, it's a social aspect. It's a, it's a self-improvement aspect. It's a, it's a, it's a learning self-defense. Um, all of that, it just feels so many so many needs that we have, I think, in, in society, you know? I would agree. Yeah. So you mentioned you started with your daughter. Mm-hmm. What was the reason? Well, <clears throat> um, growing up, I was kind of a punk. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, we're going to put this out in audio, and, and I, I, I mean this complimentary. Would never have guessed that. Oh yeah. Based, yeah. based well, on, you. based on what I, what I'm seeing from you, there, there's no vibe of being a punk. Please continue. Well, th- thank you. Uh, no, as, as a kid, I was, I was kind of a jerk and, uh, especially when in the early grades, I went to Catholic school and there was no physical education. Now you got to remember this was in the late 1950s. Um, we, uh, we bought a new house and, and, uh, I transferred to a public school and they had, you know, uh, physical education classes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I, I really took to sports, whereas before I, I wasn't really interested in it. Um, and, and they kind of helped me get into, uh, improving myself, not just physically, but, but, uh, mentally and emotionally. So I, I physical education really kind of, I grew up from that. Mm. I was always small. I'm, I'm only five, five. Um, and, uh, I was one of the smallest 
people in my going through junior high, high school, you know, college. Uh, so uh, uh, I got picked on a lot. I asked for a lot of it, like I say, you know, I, some of, a lot of it was was deserved, but um, I got tired of fighting, mm-hmm. you know, and getting my ass kicked. So uh, I took up wrestling. Uh, they, uh, they had a wrestling team and my brother and I joined wrestling team and we got to be where we were pretty good, but, but I found that, you know, hand to hand combat was really, uh, it was interesting to me. Mm-hmm. You could really improve yourself by any kind of, uh, any kind of combat. Um, it kind of tells you who you are as a person. Uh, can you lose graciously, you know, things like this. These were things um, you were realizing even at that age, even even yeah. younger. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, so uh, from there, you know, uh, in college, I, I studied judo for a little while. Um, and I was always interested in, in karate. Enter the Dragon was the movie that really, you know, uh, yeah. that really got me going in that. Um, so uh, I tried uh, taekwondo for a while. Uh, not really my thing. Uh, started in uh, uh, a Josh Goshen Jitsu karate for a little bit. Um, uh, that was okay. Uh, and then in college, you know, I kind of got away from it. Later on, my my family and I were at a uh, a festival, and uh, much to my surprise, a guy that I worked with uh, was his karate school was doing a demonstration and uh i I was completely unaware that that he he was a a a karate instructor come to find out he he was uh very proficient and and held a pretty high rank in in the showroom room so uh that's where my my daughter and i joined we were just so impressed with with the demonstration uh that uh, that we decided to pursue it Hmm. yeah and and was she aware of these things that were kind of in the back of your mind from your time as a youth? Yeah. Did, she, did she know your history with combat? Um, not a, a little bit. Um, only like the things that I told her. I mean, you know, I didn't tell her how big a jerk I was, but I told her, you know, you know, I, I wasn't really the nicest person in, in, you know, junior high and high school. Um, but, uh, luckily she was never that way. They take after their mother, <laughs> thankfully, but, uh, yeah, but she's, she's still interested in martial arts, but, uh, she doesn't have the time for, it. uh, I have a granddaughter with special needs who is taking martial arts. Oh, cool. Yeah. How um, long has she been doing that? Uh, a little, a little under a year. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I am very proud of her. She's uh, uh, she's really learning more to be more social, uh, learning to interpret uh, uh, other people's facial expressions and emotions. Uh, her coordination is just you know really mm-hmm. really improving. So um, you know I I'm very I'm very happy with that. That's great. I think there's really something to be said for, you know, specifically special needs kids, but kids uh, of of all types. The vehicle of martial arts allows them to learn within the context of movement. And anybody who's taught a group of kids knows that if you can keep them moving, it doesn't matter what it is, you know, recess is one of the easiest things you can do with a group of kids, right? Like where you get them outside and let's, you know, let's run a couple laps and then then let's sit down and talk about this thing. If you can keep them moving, you can keep them engaged. And, and I, I, I think we are on the verge as a, a, a population of finally trying to get that. I, I, th- I, think, I think there are some light bulbs and some switches flipping here. And, and, and my hope is that more and more kids, you know, like your granddaughter, will get to experience yeah. the benefits. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, research has shown that um, uh, martial arts can uh, can really uh, improve uh, uh, 
special needs kids coordination their 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 communication their ability to socialize it improves their self esteem much more so than say soccer or baseball or, or some other sport um, and really you can there's no there is no limits to to people with special needs be they you know kids or adults um it, one thing that martial artists think of which or, or in school instructors think of is that geez i i uh i don't ex- i can't expect as much from somebody with special needs and and that's not true you know yeah. i mean they're 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 kids just like any other kid they're people you know and you may have to tailor your lesson to to uh appeal to their strengths um but and it may take longer for them to to um to be proficient in a particular concept or technique but they'll get there uh you just have to persevere know uh know the person and um and and tailor like i say tailor their their lesson to to what they can do yeah uh, which i think you should be as an instructor regardless sure i I've, I've had the opportunity to work with some special needs kids not over long durations of time but shorter durations and i learned very quickly that my assumptions of my own teaching skill were grossly overestimated <laughs> really yeah it because I, I kids I think are are much better than than adults at reflecting back what you give to them right if if you if you teach them if you give them an instruction and you leave a, a mile wide gap in the middle of the instruction for them to inject their own understanding they're going to do it sometimes they'll do it to be you know a bit of a punk as you described yourself but sometimes they're just doing it out of out of ignorance you know they they, they didn't understand what you meant. Yeah. But I, I found, in, again, in my limited capacity, that the special needs students were even more directly reflective of what I asked them to do, what I gave them to do. And when I got it right, when I did a good job with it, they nailed it. They did an amazing job. When I didn't, neither of us was happy. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, and, you know, you can't, we we know how to teach. Most of us know how to teach. Mm. Uh, some of us do better than others, um, and uh, some of us do better with kids. Some better with adults. But uh, nevertheless, we all know how to basically uh, transmit the information. Mm. Uh, w- with people with special needs, you can't be afraid. You're not going to, and, and I. I Take this in, in the spirit in which it was attended. You're not sure. going to fix them. They don't need to be fixed, right? Um, it, it, you will fail, but when you do, you just pick it up and 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 try something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know the expectation. You shouldn't have to lower the bar for anything when you're working with a person with developmental disabilities or any kind of a disability. Yeah, really. I, I agree. Um, we had. Um, for example, we had a gentleman that trained with us that had cerebral palsy, uh, and and he could walk, and he had pretty use of his upper extremities. But you know, his walking was very difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, he was he was doing kata right along with the rest of us, and uh, once we were doing roundhouse kicks, Mawashi Giri, and. Uh, People want to do it, you know, they want to try doing it to the, to the head area, you know, uh, and obviously he couldn't do that. So uh, the, the, the standard was, okay, kick to the roundhouse kick to the head. Okay, it doesn't tell you how to do that. It just tells you to do that. Sure. So he says, I can't lift my leg up that high. I said, okay, tackle the person, then roundhouse him in the head. You've accomplished the standard, right? And 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 who's to say that's wrong? It's not wrong. You did what you what, what the technique called for, and and that seemed to work pretty pretty well. So I guess adapting your teaching to the person's strengths and weaknesses, uh, if you do that, 
you don't have to change. You don't have to lower the bar. Your expectations can be the same for, for those folks. They can be for anyone else. Totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. And of course, you know, you've got the, the secondary part there where, you know, if, if you're in a, a real quote unquote real situation, you really want to kick to the head. I'm, oh. I'm kicking them in the knee I'm, or, yeah. or lower. Right. And, yeah, and, and, you know, I, I like what you're saying here, this idea, because it, it, this extends beyond special needs or, or, or physical disability challenge, because we're all different, right? And anybody who's been successful teaching for a while knows that they are adapting what they teach, how they say, what they demonstrate based on who's in front of them, the composition of the class, or if it's a one-on-one situation, they're making modifications on the fly. Good instructors recognize do that that they need to do that the best instructors recognize and are able to do that and when you're when you're willing to look at things in that way that hey we're all a little bit different my roundhouse kick's not quite going to look like your roundhouse kick even if you know theoretically we're good to go with all of our limbs and everything we're just there are there are small differences we we have different experiences it's going to look a little different and i think when when you can take a step back from standardization because standardization, I think is what leads to this concept of I, we have to fix, right? We have to, we have to intervene in whatever way that gets from where you are to correct the right way, you know, but that, that suggests that something's broken. And exactly. I think, we, and, and that, that I think is a disservice, not only to the individual, but to the beauty of martial arts and helping people move on their own individual path in the direction that they, I mean, we all kind of wander in the same direction, but we're not on the same path. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, it, it, our, our instructors, uh, I had the, the, the privilege to train with Sekichi Iha, who's a, a 10th dine in the showroom room, the, the Chibana lineage. And uh, he would say, make karate your own. And, and by that he meant, um, as as you point out, we're all different. Some of us are 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 big. Some of us are small. You know, and and there there's an infinite different number of differences between between us. And and your karate is not going to look like my karate. Mine's not going to look like yours. So uh, you make it your own. You do uh, you do what what suits you the best. Um, Nakazato sensei. Uh, tenth down in in, in uh, showman room, what was a big, uh, a big fella, very big, big and strong. Okay, and and he his blocks would be powerful. Iha Sensei's blocks was more softer, and and a misdirection because he was a smaller guy. Um, so they're they're both correct, you know, and you can't like. You can't expect someone to do, as you point out, exactly like what somebody else is expected to do. Uh, now, when I think when you're dealing with Q ranks, beginners, that's a little tougher because you're, the expectation is this has got to look like a, you know, this, is, this has got to look like a May Gary. This has got to look like, you know. Uh, so when you're teaching the fundamentals, uh, you may have to be a little stricter with that. But once, once someone reaches Dan rank, then they can start learning and, and then start making, uh, adapting their martial art to what they can do, right? Yeah. It, lower ranks, they're so far off the target that you, you have to be, it's, it's, kind, it's kind of like if, you're, if I was going to drive from here to Albany, I can let up on how strict of an angle my car drives, the closer I get. If I'm off by 30 degrees on the compass, as I start driving to you, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to end up in Poughkeepsie. I'm going to end up in New York <laughs> city, maybe even Trenton, right? Like sure. this is not where I want to be. Yeah. Uh, no disrespect to Trenton, but if I get really exact, even if I'm wishy-washy, even if I'm all over the place, even if that road is swinging back and forth and up and down, it's keeping me more or less on track. And as I get better, as I get closer to the quote unquote goal, or in this case, this destination, yeah, I can, I can relax a little bit on it. Okay. I'm going over there. So it's 
let's head back. Sometimes I veer off, sometimes I veer back on. And I, I get the freedom to do that as I know where I'm going and have more experience on where I've been. Sure. That's, that's the journey, right? Yeah. Of, you know, just, just constant, uh, for us, it would be constant refinement, uh, trying to get a deeper understanding of, of the things that we're doing. Um, and ultimately, if you can pass that knowledge on to other people, I mean, th- that that's the ultimate, you know, to practice um, your, your art and to be able to teach others, I think is, I mean, it's, it's the, no matter what it is, whether it's martial arts or, or astronomy or, or what, you know, um, uh, th- that's the most gratifying profession, I think, that, that there is. You know. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, switch it up a little bit here, please. Um, I have your book. Uh, oh, I have w- one of your books. I have um, uh, the uh, stronger people are harder to kill. <laughs> what do you think? Well, um, it, I, it was it was excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, excellent. It. it, uh, it I, I'm I'm very committed to physical fitness, mm. and um, I haven't been saying using that phrase, uh, but I would say that uh, all things being equal, the better conditioned fighter is the one that will prevail. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I don't I don't think there's anybody that disagrees with that if they're being honest with themselves. Uh, well. Okay. With with the I, I condition that you threw in, all all other things being equal, yeah, I think that's I, I a, that's, that's a critical statement. I hope that's the case, because you still have you still have people that come to the dojo or the training hall, whatever, uh, once or twice a week, and and that's the extent of their training. The rest of the time, they're um, you, you know they're they're not paying attention to to their physical fitness. Mm-hmm. Um, at any age, uh, kids, especially, you know, they don't, I mean, they're all in shape anyway, most of the time, but, uh, they, they, it's very important to, to, to be physically fit in case, God forbid, you are confronted in the situation. Um, going to, going to class twice a week, once or twice a week and calling that your training obviously is, is insufficient. You have to train on your own and to supplement that training, uh, you know, you have to do some kind of conditioning. Mm. Uh, it doesn't matter. I don't think what that is. Some people lift weights. Some people, I, I like, uh, uh, body weight exercises. I've done them for a long time because you can take them anywhere. Sure. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's why at 67, I think I can still work out as hard as I, I do. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I've been to classes where, you know, I'm, I'm doing well, I'm looking around at younger people, you know, and they're, they're not in near as good a shape. And, and, you know, you kind of worry about them, you know, you kind of yeah. like, geez, you know, are you gonna, are you gonna be able to, um, you know, are, are you gonna be able to survive a fight? You know, right. Um, right. It, and this is a delicate subject because when it when it comes up, I think there there's a portion of the population that confuses the expression of an ideal, stronger people are harder to kill. Being healthier is is an objectively good thing, right? And we can we can say objectively that again, all things being equal, carrying excess body weight makes you less healthy, right? Like these are things that we can state. And, and if people are being honest and they're willing to be real with research and and the way the world works, these are things we can all agree on. But sometimes people get nervous. They get anxious. They get offended. We, We live in a country where the majority of the population based on the metrics that are put out is overweight. And it can be really hard within the martial arts world where we tend to be pretty darn inclusive. I mean, we were, we were talking about special needs people. You're, you're not seeing a lot of special needs integration in other 
pursuits in, in the same way that we are inclusive in the martial arts. I mean, most schools, we don't care who you are and what you do. We want you to show up and try. And, you know, I, I'm going to try and work on my thing and you're going to be over there working on your thing. And I'm going to move on my path and at my rate, and you're going to work on your path at your rate. And, and that's a good thing. And we're, we're, we're doing an individual sport together. Mm -hmm. So, but the rest yeah. of the world doesn't always offer that opportunity, right? Because the, the, those, those relatively subjective metrics within the martial arts become much more objective. You know, if I'm, if I'm much heavier than I am, I'm not going to run as fast. I'm probably not going to make the track team, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are, there are, there are people who may be heavier than say, you know, their, their ideal body weight should be, but are still very healthy, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so, but nevertheless, it's the health aspect and not so much the, the weight or what you look like. It's, it's, can you physically perform, you know, when the chips are down yeah. and, you know, like you point out in the book, <clears throat> your chances are better if you're in shape. Uh, I mean, th there was a study that I was reading just the other day where uh, uh, cardiovascular fitness reduces your risk of, of uh, dementia by 33% yeah. in older adults. So, I mean, exercise does so much for for you as a person, I mean, not only, not only physically, but mentally and emotionally, uh, it's, it's, it's just, it's so important. And, uh, there used to be a, a president's council on physical fitness. Where I remember it was that when I was a kid. Yeah. 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 Uh, started by, I think John F. Kennedy and, uh, it was emphasized in, in the schools, you know, mm -hmm. all schools had to have physical education and, and there was, uh, you would be assessed. We'd be assessed every year mm -hmm. on the number of sit-ups we could do, push-ups we could do. We had to do a shuttle run and like that. Sit and um, reach. I remember the sit and reach. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And they'd measure how far out you yeah. could go. Um, and we don't see that anymore. You know, we really don't. I mean, I don't know what gym class looks like today. You know, in, in my school. understanding is it's dramatically different depending on where you are. Hmm. Okay. All right. Nevertheless, there should be, I mean, we should be teaching, you know, our kids to take better care of their, of their bodies. I mean, we, we kind of a little bit, maybe they have health class, but you know, I mean, let's be honest, you know, most kids really health class is a joke. It always mm -hmm. has been. And, uh, it's, and I mean no disrespect to health health teachers or anything like anyone like that, but you know, un unless it's established early that we really need to take better care of our of ourselves physically, um, you know, we're just going to continue down the road where obesity is going to be an issue, uh, dementia is going to be an issue, our you know health care costs are going to continue to to spiral. Um, and, and it's, it's just, it's not good. You know, we've turned a tipping point recently in, in the U S and, you know, for our international listeners, you know, I, I can't speak to the global numbers. I'm not as aware of those, but in the U S for the first time, our life expectancy has gone down. It's mm -hmm. the first time that's happened to our knowledge really ever. And, and, you know, I'm sure we could, we could go back hundreds of years and, and see blips where, you know, a plague comes through and knocks it down uh, on average. But if we're getting better on all these things, that number should continue to go up or at least plateau. It shouldn't be going down, but it is going down and it, it's going down in direct correlation from, from my understanding of the data with a lack of movement an increase in obesity and again, this isn't, this is not attacking obesity. It's, it's the recognition that, you know, choices have impact choices, carry consequences. And I, I think movement and exercise, which I term as two very different things are absolutely critical to mm -hmm. health and 
to me, I go so far as to say that being unhealthy, knowingly being unhealthy is not self-defense. If the goal of self-defense is to remain alive and you spend 90% of your time preparing for a situation that has a very small likelihood of occurring and you spend virtually no time preparing for something that we all face, aging, and preparing for that, are we really defending oneself? That's an interesting thought. Um, Not original to me. I forget where I took it, but well, I like nevertheless, it. It, it still, you know, we'll give you credit for it. Well, thank um, you. It's it, it is to me. It it is part of your training, mm-hmm. isn't that? Um, just like, um, just well, okay. I like to research uh, bunkai, mm-hmm. you know, and and from that learning or mental aspect. You know, um, uh, that's part of training to me. Um, it, it's 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 mind, body, and spirit, right? Um, that's that's the the foundation of of most martial arts. You know, uh, you improve your mind, you improve your body, you improve your spirit. Well, um, it, you have to you have to address all three in order to consider yourself. A, a complete martial artist. I'm not there yet. You know, I, I don't know who who is. I'm, I'm sure, you know, the, the great masters have attained that level. But um, you know, it'll it'll take me, you know, the rest of my life before I even come close to that. Uh, but still, that has to be part of your training. You know, as you say, yeah. Um, it it just it just makes complete sense. We can talk till we're blue in the face about the importance of, you know, practicing at home mm-hmm. and, and uh, you know, exercising or taking better care of yourself physically. And until somebody really gets it, you know, it's just it's just not going to happen. There's um, I don't know if this is a Tony Robbins. I've heard it in the context of a Tony Robbins thing. I don't know that it's original statement to him. People will do more to avoid pain than they will to gain pleasure, right? And, and so what do you mean by that, Jeremy? Well, when do people often stop smoking? When their doctor says, look, like these numbers are bad or you have like you have, you're in the beginnings of lung cancer, et cetera. Like people will maintain their course until they're giving it very strong, dramatic reason not to. It's, it's how we're wired. And I think understanding that and, and being willing to maybe play with what you term those consequences, not waiting until it's too late. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that's something that I, I kind of play some mental trickery with myself. Because, yeah. Working out isn't isn't always fun. It's not always easy. You know, working hard and getting sweaty when you can sit on the couch and eat chips, you know, that's one is a much easier decision than the other. Mm-hmm. But what about on the other side? You know, how do you feel after you've been sitting on the couch for two hours eating chips versus, you know, after you spent 30 minutes even working out, even at a moderate pace? Like you're gonna feel a heck of a lot better there than post chips. And you know, whatever form your exercise takes it should be enjoyable to you so you don't have that you know oh geez i gotta go work out um and and it should be something that you actually look forward to and in yeah. fact incorporate it into your into your everyday routine um if uh, i i would dread having to uh you know go out for a mile run or something like that i've got oh geez you I gotta me both today. not my favorite yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll get my I'll get my cardio some other way, um, but I I enjoy doing uh, uh, body weight exercises, yeah. uh, and uh, it, it's it's a great stress reliever. Um, I found. I mean, I can be in a very foul mood, and uh, and and go downstairs and 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 work out, and I feel much better. And it's I mean, really hard to be in a bad mood when you're exhausted. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, you get those endorphins and, and the encephalins, uh, activated and 
you know, it, they are the runner's high, right? right. So uh, you do feel a lot better about things. Um, so to me, it's inconceivable how somebody can, uh, cannot want to exercise or, or move or do something to make themselves healthier. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't have to cost a thing. Yeah. But your uh, time. there's, you know, and this came up, Andrew and I recorded a few Thursday episodes earlier today. And, and one of the things that comes up, and this comes up a lot for me in my, my non whistle kick professional work, I do some business and marketing consulting. We're at a point in society now where people are so afraid of making the wrong choice, of getting things wrong, of doing things incorrectly, that they'll not take any action. Because with the growth of social media, people, so many people are very quick to judge and tear people apart, even take pictures. I mean, there are, there are entire social media groups dedicated to people looking foolish in a, um, a conventional gym, you know, a lifting gym. And if, if you're someone who is thinking about lifting weights and you know nothing about it and you bump into a few of those videos, you're now potentially terrified of stepping into that space, looking foolish and being made fun of. So nope, I'll just stay home where nobody's going to make fun of me. Sure. There's cultural reinforcement into this. So I, I don't want anybody who's listening to think that um, either of us believe this to be easy. It is simple, but it is not easy. And I think it's an important distinction to make. Sure. If it were, I mean, what's that old saying? If uh, related to karate, if 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 uh, if it was easy to be a black belt, everyone would have one. That's right. Uh, anything that's worth doing takes an effort. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the hardest thing to do is the right thing to do. Mm. And uh, it's it, it, maybe it's just because I mean I'm older than you, but still, when you get to be our age, I mean, not that we're the same age, you understand, but uh, you know what I mean. Um, I, I think we have a better appreciation for that because we weren't raised with social media, right? Um, and uh, and it, it's 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 really it has its purpose, but it's it's been in many ways a detriment to, to, uh, civilization. Yeah. You know? Any technology that we seem to develop swings on a pendulum, you know, there's this rapid adoption and it reach, reaches a crest and then it starts to fall back. And I think that that's where we are with social media. I think we've realized, Oh, there's a bit too much of this and people are, are leaving in droves. Uh, Facebook reported its first ever reduction in user activity. And, and, you know, at least temporarily, their, their stock dipped considerably because people realized, oh, wait, this has gone as big as it's going to, at least in that aspect, as part of their rebranding with Meta and everything else. But there's a lot of benefits. I mean, every technology has benefits, but you can go back, you can read about the printing press and the, the critique of giving people access to information that they can just... What, what, what do you mean? They don't have to go through the nobles and the church to, to learn what a book says? Like, like this is dangerous. And, you know, we, we're saying the same things now. And we will continue to say the same things with, with technology. But that doesn't mean that there isn't tremendous benefit. You, you said you enjoy training, training Bunkai. It's pretty darn easy to connect with some of these folks in the world. I and mean, we've had a few of them on the show, Ian Ebernethy, of course, and, mm -hmm. and others who live in this world and we can learn so much from them w without having to, you know, fly to Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's one of the resources I regularly consult. Yeah. Uh, he's amazing. Uh, he is. And you've had him on the show. I think, yeah. uh, 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 um, Paul and Dan have had him on their show as well. Mm. Um, and he's, he's a great guy. He's, he's very humble. Um, and, and, uh, he has a, he has a great sense of humor, um, but he, the stuff he knows mm. is, is amazing. Um, and although we, we don't train in the same art, he adapts his, his bunkai to fit the, the art that you're doing, mm. you know, so you may be, there may be a tangential relationship between the two, but nevertheless, you know, he, he will, 
he talks about, well, if you're in, you know, Shoru, you might do this, Goju, you might do this or something, you know. Um, and uh, it's just, the guy is just, just brilliant. Yeah. And he loves what he does and it comes through. Oh, I totally. Think I think that's why he's been successful. You know, anytime I, I have two sayings when I, two, two boxes I try to check when, I, when I'm teaching. I want him to have fun and I want him to learn something. Mm -hmm. And if you get the first one, the second one's a lot easier. Much. Yeah, much easier. Yeah, yeah. much easier. Yeah. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I was I was going to kind of circle back to some things. Sure. You know, it, you sound like you spent a lot of time in, in introspection. And it sounds like you've always been a, a bit of that analytical kind of contemplative personality. So I'm sure you've spent time thinking about, you know, what you might have done differently with the knowledge that you have now. This is one of my favorite questions to ask guests. Because we have folks who are new to martial arts learning. And, and in fact, sometimes I even get emails from people who are considering martial arts and thought they'd kind of dip their toe in by listening to people talk about martial arts. Mm -hmm. If you were to go back to day one or year one or you know, somewhere in there with what you know now, what you've experienced to this point, what might you advise yourself? Are there words of wisdom that you would share? Don't be afraid to fail. Um, How do you define failure? Well, to me, the way I, I would think yeah. about it back then is if I didn't do something exactly the way I was shown or taught. Okay. In other words, as a beginner, I mean, this is completely unrealistic, but I would think that as a beginner, I should just be able to walk out onto that, onto that floor and be able to do what the instructor is doing just like him. <laughs> <laughs> you're not well, alone i think we've all had that feeling and yeah and and, and that rarely happens it looks so simple why can't i do it exactly you know i'm athletic i can do this but you know obviously there's a learning process that goes along with that um and i, I there was several times that i st actually stopped training for you know a, a mm. few months because i was discouraged and wow. and maybe comparing myself to others as human beings, we tend to do that no matter what, don't we? I mean, uh, and in martial arts, that's, you know, that, that is, uh, that is definitely the, the wrong thing to do. Um, you know, it's you're if you're competing with anyone, you're competing with yourself. Can I improve? Can I be better today than I was yesterday? Mm. And, uh, as a as a newbie, so to speak, um, I didn't I didn't learn that. Mm -hmm. I didn't I wasn't aware of that. Um, and uh, uh, it, it would like I say it would be discouraging, and and I'd stop for a while. Uh, but then you know it, so there's something there that kind of calls you back, and, and you go back and and maybe a little wiser, you know maybe a little more mature, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and. So that would be, to answer your question, that would be it for me. How about for you? I started when I was pretty young, but I, I think the, the, the best advice I, I, I ever received in martial arts wasn't given in terms of advice. It was given in terms of a realization. And, and I, I've talked about this on the show a couple of times, but um, in the initial school that I trained in, the first person earned black belt and had a high rank before. I don't remember if it was black belt or brown belt in another karate style. So he earned black belt pretty quickly. He was, you know, incredibly dedicated, trained five days a week, et cetera. And I think it was like three to four years he earned his black belt. And I remember being probably eight or nine and standing there with my mother. And she said, what does it feel like to have a black belt? And he said, you realize how much you don't know. And so that sat with me for probably a good 10, 15 years before I realized the depth of, of the wisdom in that statement. And it led to what I and, and, and a number of other people refer to as white belt mentality. I just want to learn. I just want to train. I don't care. I don't, I don't care who it is. I don't care if I've been training longer than them. I don't care if they have higher rank or lower rank, if you have anything to teach about, I want to learn it. 
because you talked about being a complete martial artist. It's a, to me, that's an unattainable goal because there's so much. And the more I learn, the more I realize there's even more that I'm never going to learn, but it doesn't stop me from driving towards it. And when I was younger, I was, martial arts was the first thing I found where I received recognition, validation from other people. So as a kid who was the biggest nerd in school, but had martial arts, I became arrogant within that context. Really? And so, yeah, yeah, because here I am, there's, here's this thing where I'm, I'm, I'm good and people tell me I'm good. And nobody anywhere tells me I'm good at anything other than the teachers at school. And I get, you know, I get pooped on for that by my peers. And I think if I, if I could go back and say, it's okay to be good, but it's, it's not okay to think so highly of being good that you start to put on blinders and you miss opportunities for getting even better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, that's a, a humility that we try to we try to have. We think we're humble, you know, um, but oftentimes we're not. Uh, checking your ego at the door mm. uh, when you when you when you come in to any situation uh, to me is is the ultimate white belt mindset, you know. And uh, easier said than done. Oh, for sure. I've, I've found that I've learned so much from working with white belts, you know? Um, and it's because, you know, let's be honest, if it's their first exposure to martial arts, um, that, that you're going to tell them to throw, you, uh, uh, you know, okay, Oizuki, and it could look like anything <laughs> coming at you, you know? That's and right. So you you have to you know where you're used to you know your the other the other you dance and doing it exactly the way you 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 do it um, with proper technique and form and and whatever uh, this could come out of nowhere so you have to be prepared for that and uh, and, and just there uh, many of them have an enthusiasm you know for for the art they just want to. They, they want to drink it all in. And uh, you think to yourself, maybe subconsciously, geez, I remember when, when I was like that, I, I wish I had that, that enthusiastic spirit right now. And then um, if you think a little further, it's like, why, why can't I, you know, um, uh, it's like a, you know, it's a journey and we'll never attain, you know, the goal that we're working for, but the journey is, is the reward it, itself. Right. I mean, we're getting a little philosophical here and I didn't mean my, to you know, please I'm, I'm, never apologize for that on here. It's my favorite <laughs> stuff. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I don't mean to pontificate, but, but still it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's deeper than learning how to, how to kick and punch and block, you know, so much more. You, you may start there, but then, you know, if if you're serious, you, it can make you a much better person. And uh, you know, all, most of the martial artists that I've had the privilege of training with and meeting are are very nice people. And there seems to be a difference almost between between them and uh, the average person who doesn't train in the martial arts. Yeah. It's uh. I, I hesitate to call it a warrior mentality, but there's, there's a, there's a humility and a confidence and, um, and, and just a, uh, 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 an empathy, you know, for, for other people. And, uh, you, we try to attain that. We fall down a lot, you know, but then you get back up and you try to, you, you try to get back on that path. And, and I, I'd like to think that I'm, I'm on that. I'm that kind of a person. I, I hope, but uh, you know that'll be up to others to judge. You know, uh, but still, like I say, it is more than just practicing techniques. You know, uh, 
to defend yourself. It's, it's, it's your entire life. Yeah. Um, people say, you know, you know, I, I, I do karate or I take karate and, uh, to, to seasoned martial artists, that's, it's, it kind of gives you a chuckle, doesn't it? It's like, you know, it, it's uh, so hard to find that, find the correct verb. We've actually had a fair amount of discussion in various episodes about that verb is, is, is there one that you use to describe? I study or I mm. practice, you know, I, I practice karate. I study karate, you know, um, but you know, I take dance lessons, mm. <laughs> you know, and I, and I, yeah. I, 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 but I, th- I think once you get to a point, um, where where it becomes part of you that then it's something that you practice you know um and and yeah so that that would be my verb mm. what would be yours it, this one did not come easy to me but uh play oh we, we we've had that come up i think there were two or three guests and, and i apologize i don't remember who of the guests brought this up but one, one of my big things is to go back to finding your why. Why do you train? Why, why do you continue to train? And, you know, for me, it's so ingrained in who I am that I, I don't think I could stop. I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 43. I started training when I was four. How do, how do I stop doing something I've done for that long? How do you walk away from that? And what I like about you know, and and this is not disparaging your choice of word or anybody else's choice of word, you know, practice or study or train. I do all of those too. But I am happiest when I play martial arts because think think of all the things that are play, right? You're, You're doing it. You don't have to. It's enjoyable. It's best when other people are involved, right? And that describes my happiest moments in martial arts. I'm with other people. I'm making friends. We're working together. We're making each other better. And yeah, there's some, there's at least some smiles, maybe even laughter at our mutual experiences. For sure. I I never thought of it like that. I mean, although it is very enjoyable to me. Uh, Some of my, uh, happiest experiences in the martial arts has been like at, at a, uh, at a, a training camp yes. where, where our association has gotten together and everybody is on the training floor all at once, all doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. And you're part of a whole and it, it, it's, you feel a sense of belonging and yet uh, there's an individuality to it. You're mm-hmm. trying to, you're trying to do better, whether it's to impress somebody else or impress yourself. Um, but that it's there. There's a joy to it, not unlike what you would get if you were uh, playing something with with, uh, with other people. Yeah, right. that's, it's that's, it's not a perfect word, but it, it's I, I I'm sure there's probably some Japanese concept because all all the best Japanese words seem to require like six different English words and we shoehorn them in and, you know, we, we get something right. Um, there's probably some Japanese concept that better expresses this or, or if nothing better, we can make a German word, and squish six of them together and just have a run on sentence. It's a single word. They're, they're great at that. But I want to have fun because if it's fun, I'm going to keep doing it. And there are there are plenty of times for being serious, even in the context of training. I mean, and I, I'm I'm never going to run someone's uh, rank testing with like mirth, like it's not going to be a joke. You know, I'm going to want them and everyone else involved to take that seriously because that you know traditionally I, I think it's a um, it it is more impactful if you do that. I, I, your the look on your face tells me you you agree. I do. But, yeah. But that doesn't mean that there aren't even in that context moments where there's some humor. Maybe it's intentional, usually not. But there can still be humor and joy because we're hardwired to continue doing the things that bring us joy. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. 
Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I'm still, I'm still digesting the, the concept of play at martial arts because, well, okay. When, uh, we would do sparring, mm-hmm. right? Um, I've often referred to it as a rough game of tag, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and, and, uh, when, when you get hit, at least this happens to me quite a bit. If I get hit, I kind of laugh a little bit because right. there is humor in that. It's like, holy crap. How, you know, you, it, it, uh, it, it's fun not to get hit so much, but, um, it, it's, but if it you're with fun. someone that you like and trust, yeah, and you're again, it's that mutual benefit. You're challenging each other. The the mm-hmm. delta between skill is not usually so great that you're not helping each other out. And one of you lands something or does something that you haven't pulled off before. Something unexpected. You both smile. It's like, oh, okay, you got me. Yeah. I I see what's going on here, right? And even it could be it could be a strike that drew a little bit of blood. In some t- some context, or or a, you know, a good shot to the ribs, you're like, oh, like that's going to bruise, and you're still smiling and laughing about it. Yeah. Whereas if a stranger walks up to you on the street and kicks you in the ribs, and you're bruised, it's going to start a fight, right? Like like context matters. And within that playfulness, things are okay. Yeah, yeah. That's a neat, a unique perspective that you have, and uh, now that I think about it. It is very much like play, um, and but I think it, it doesn't become that until you've been uh, playing for a while. Mm. Let's say you know uh, serious play. I've heard others term it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is. It is fun, and and like I didn't start training with, as at such a young age as you did, but it's it's definitely become a part of who i am um and i can't imagine if i god forbid had to stop for some reason but what what kind of a person i would be <laughs> i'd be miserable um it, what, what could make you stop though you know and and and, and hopefully uh, i won't be specific i don't want to put those things out to the world but you know i i suspect you just as i know people with some some pretty severe physical challenges who still train sure. and they still progress and they still love what they do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know what it would take death. Maybe I, I think that's the only way I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if, even if we succumb to some debilitating injury, um, train, you could still train, you know, in some fashion, uh, whether it's, it, I mean, physically, mentally, uh, whatever. Um, you can you can still do some kind some kind of training, right. and uh, yeah, I I don't think I could I couldn't stop, and and if I did, I'd have to be six feet under. Really, that's what it would take for me, anyway. Yeah, right there with you. Yeah, yeah. What's the most interesting topic you've talked about on wow. your on your podcast? I I don't I don't know how to. How to answer that? You're you're doing a really good job of turning this back around. I I like what I have podcasters on because we end up with this odd dynamic, and it's like who's who's interviewing who sometimes, which I I find fun because just as the impetus for for Karate Cafe was real organic conversation with other martial artists and, and a desire to capture that, mine was the same. I remembered people at martial arts events, summer camps, it, you know, hang, I, I was high enough rank at a young age that I could kind of be on the edges and listen. I couldn't talk, but I could listen. And they'd get a couple beers in them and they start telling stories. I was like, oh, I love these stories. But if you ask them out of that context or without, you know, the social lubricant of the alcohol, they, uh, you know, I'll tell you later. They wouldn't tell those stories. My favorite thing about what we do is when someone gets somewhere through conversation, because I consider conversation, discussion, 
on martial arts to be an element of martial arts training, that, that understanding, you know, we are in, in my, in my opinion, practicing or playing martial arts right now, not the physical attributes, you know, mm-hmm. other than I'm gesticulating fairly wildly at times, but we are working through some of the mental concepts, which I think are just as, if not more important as we progress. But when someone starts into one of those concepts and they have a, oh, and I can see them or hear them connect dots that they've never connected before. That somehow through our conversation, they had an epiphany and it's happened maybe a half dozen times over the years. And I absolutely love that because they usually email me later and they're like, I, 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 I don't Ooh, I, I'm still reeling from, from that. And I think open, honest conversation about martial arts is something, you know, we don't have much open, honest com- conversation in the world, let alone about a subject that most people consider to be 99% physical. When true. we both know from training for a long time, it's not. And actually, I'd say that the longer you go on, the less physical it is. I, I, I could not throw a roundhouse kick for a few weeks and step back out and probably be 99% of where I was when I stopped because I've done enough roundhouse kicks. Mm-hmm. I can't train everything all the time. There's too much to do. But as we get into these things, it enhances my understanding. So when I go back and I throw that round kick, roundhouse kick, I have a better understanding of why I'm throwing it. And it's that much more meaningful and impactful figuratively and if the case calls for it, literally. Hmm. Yeah. Um, hmm. So let, let me, let me turn that around a little bit. Aren't you a better martial artist because of the conversations you had on your show? Uh, yes. And, and not just on the show, but it, in, in most any conversation I've had with another martial artist, but like you say, this is, I'm learning stuff here. Um, and it can be a martial artist from a completely different style. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 I believe that's true. And I, I would like to think that that's true for most any martial artist. It, it just improves you. Um, because it, in one way or another, the person you're conversing with has taken kind of the same path you're on. And there's a sense of camaraderie almost. And uh, I'll share with you what I know and you share with me what you know. It's reciprocal. And uh, I mean, that's what a conversation is supposed to be. And, and you know, w- when you talk about these, these informal get togethers after a camp, after class at camp at nighttime, you know, where, where the adult beverages are flowing and, and people tend to loosen up, uh, the stories that you hear, uh, you know, the, the, the insight that you get is just something that, I mean, you can't measure that. You, you can't explain it. But you just feel, you almost feel like the same way, uh, like when I described how I felt, like doing kata with 100 other people on the floor. Mm. You know, it's almost the same feeling, you know. Uh, it's just, that, like I say, that sense of camaraderie, of of uh, of of a common, you know, traversing a common path towards some goal that we know we'll never attain. And yet we do it anyway. Yeah. You know? Um, I mean, that's, to me, that's a passion that very few people today have for anything, you know, um, anything, period. Uh, and it's, it's self-improvement. It's, it's, learning how to protect yourself and your loved ones or other people. Um, and it, it just, it just continued. You just grow every day. You grow here. I go pontificating again. So, but you, you know, you get my point. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just hanging out with other martial artists, whether it's training or playing or, or, you know, uh, getting drunk together. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a, uh, it's almost like a, a fraternity that, you know, that you, you're always going to be a member of. You know, you're just missing the, the varsity letter jacket, I guess. 
<laughs> maybe we should make maybe, I like, maybe that's what geese are supposed to be maybe maybe we should start doling out instead of instead of rank belts big fuzzy like you know if you do karate k's or you know t's for taekwondo practitioners yeah <laughs> letter turn turn your turn your uniform into a letterman jacket yeah <laughs> <laughs> no thanks. I'm gonna sh- I'm gonna show up somewhere with, with like a big fuzzy I don't know what probably whistle kick logo because how do I define what I do? Uh, big fuzzy whistle kick logo on the chest and see if anybody gets it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> they, they might. I mean, your uh, you you your uh, your your podcast and your website. I mean, you are of uh, of some renown. Let's say. Um, we have some reach. Yeah, you're one reach. of the um, you're one of the foremost martial arts podcasts around. Period. Well, uh, thank you. Um, it, it's really just because of the persistence. You know, the the you you talk towards the top about the guests that we've had on, and it's really it's just a result of continuing. You know, as as we get guests of of a certain notoriety, we can reach out to other guests who are a little bit bigger and say, here are these three other guests who are maybe just a little bit below you. And we just keep climbing the ladder that way. And it really, to me, it just reflects how everything in martial arts goes. You just keep going. If you don't stop and you apply some effort, you're gonna you're gonna move forward. It might be slow. You know, the show doesn't move forward quickly, but we're moving forward. Well, yeah, I mean you you completed o- almost 700 episodes in the in the comparatively brief time that you've been on i mean you guys are pretty pro- prolific yeah and, uh, it it's all it, it's all very interesting you know and and again when you listen to a podcast when a martial artist listens to a podcast whether it's yours or karate cafe or whatever it is again you're you're taking part in that conversation so to speak that you would when you're <clears throat> after class, when you're when you're uh, socializing with others, and, or whether you're on the training floor, you know, doing kata with all those people. It's still the same, still the same uh, sense of belonging, and and uh, and that that you can relate to what's going on. You know, um, I think that's why uh, a lot of talk radio uh, is appealing. You know, if I understand like correctly, it. it's really the only broadcast radio genre that continues to survive. You know, people have switched to streaming and downloaded music in their vehicles for music, mm-hmm. but talk radio still has a place because yeah. people want to feel part of that conversation. You and I are having a great conversation, but there are a whole bunch of people who are listening to this conversation and they they're part of it. It's a, it's a one way part. You know, we, we, we can generically say things to them. We can't single them out, but they can still feel like they're, they're adjacent. And, and I, I think there's a lot of value to that. I, I, I certainly listen to podcasts, both martial arts and otherwise. And, and that's my favorite thing about it. I, I feel like I'm there with them when it's done well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and and that's what that's the appeal, right? I mean, mm. that's what keeps you coming back. And if you find one or two that you particularly like, you know, you'll those will be your go-to podcast. Yeah, I got you know, I got some time to kill. You know, I'll 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 listen to this or, or and and unlike talk radio, you can you can listen to podcasts obviously anytime you want. Right. You know, I have uh, I have. Uh, I have favorite radio programs that I listen to, but unless they're podcasted, you know, unless I listen to them live, you know, then I, I miss them. Sure. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a, it's a great venue, you know, and, and uh, I'm so glad that, that it, it developed in, into what it is, you know, thanks for kicking it off. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I, I had nothing. I was just asked to like, basically, I was the the talent, and that's in quotes. You know, I just introduced the shows and and like that, but uh, it was, 
it was fun. It was fun, and and it still is uh, a lot of fun to listen to to you guys and to and to some others. And I'll just keep doing that. I give you a lot of credit for sticking with it, man. I mean, I don't, I don't do well at stopping things. It's there. There's a skill at stopping things, and and there are some things in my past that I wish I'd stopped doing sooner. <laughs> I'm glad I did not stop doing this. Yeah, because it leads to some great stuff. So I got I got one one final piece. You know, we're gonna we're gonna fade here. So what do you want to tell the listeners? You know, you you've already told them quite a bit, but this is this is where we roll out, and I'll record an outro later. What do you want to tell them? Jeez, I don't know. <laughs> um, I I can't think of anything other than what we've been talking about. That um, it's what we do is definitely worth it, and it can be, it can, it's going to be whatever you make it out to be. Um, and it can improve you as a person in so many ways. Um, you know, just, just keep doing it. And, you know, I, I, I have no words of wisdom. I, I mean, I've got, I, you, you I, already I, used, shared them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I'm, I'm completely spent. No more wisdom here. <laughs> But uh, I appreciate you, you uh, uh, inviting me on. I, like I say, I've, I've been very intimidated, you know, uh, because of the, you know, who you guys are and the, and the, uh, and the, the people that you've had on. Uh, I'm just small potatoes. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, I'm very grateful that you found the time to talk to me. And uh, it's, uh, it's been an honor. I, I hope that uh, you guys will continue with your success. Um, it's, uh, you definitely are making a difference in the martial arts world. I, we will, on behalf of your listeners, we appreciate what you guys do. I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly did. Hopefully that came through Gene. Thanks for your time. And I'm really looking forward to getting to connect with you in person audience. If I forget if this came up during the episode or if it was outside, he doesn't live that far away. So those of you who come to Whistlekick events wouldn't surprise me if you see him at one of them in the near future. I'm looking forward to that. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com to see the show notes. That's where you're going to find the videos, the links, the social media, pictures, so much more. And it's not just for this episode. Remember, it's for all of them. They're all over there. And if you're up for supporting us in the work that we do, you have lots of options. You could leave a review. You could buy one of our many books on Amazon or help out with our Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. Want to bring me into your school? How about I come in and teach a seminar? We can do that. Reach out and we'll make it happen. Don't forget the code PODCAST15 gets you 15% off anything at whistlekick.com. And if you have feedback, topic, or guest suggestions, anything that you want to share, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And our social media is at whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>